welcome to Focusing on God's Word with Pastor Everton Jeffers. Focusing on God's Word illuminates the Word of God by explaining the Scriptures and conducting word studies using Scripture to support Scripture in the revelation of His Word. Matthew eleven fifteen said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. As he ministered to us today, here now is Pastor Everton Jeffers. Uh, good morning once again. It's a pleasure to be back with you this morning. And this morning I'm going to be dealing with a topic that I think is very pertinent to today's time. It is very important that as Christians, and especially those of us who minister the Word of God, speak on the issues that are current. And this one, I think, is going to be one that I think you should gather all your friends, your relatives, your neighbors, and tell them, come and listen to this, because I think that this will determine a lot of things in the future. This morning, I want to speak to you on the subject of the appointment. Many of us in our lives have made many appointments, and some of the times when we make these appointments, we know that we were not able to keep them, but we made these appointments anyway. What I want to say this morning is that we have often made appointments. We make appointments with our doctors. We make appointments with our friends. We make appointments with our families. And many a times, the doctors will cancel an appointment. We will cancel appointment. Our families will cancel appointment. But this morning, we're going to look at an appointment that none of us can cancel. And it's going to be from one verse, one passage of scripture, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. In this particular verse, I'm going to give you six facts about death that all of us should be aware of. Six facts about death that all of us should be aware of. Now, this is what the verse says. It is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment let me repeat that again it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment the first fact that i really want to bring out in this particular important passage is it is appointed this appointment, although it has been changed a few times, these few times that it has been changed, it is the, accept it's the, the exception, but not the rule. Let me repeat that again. These times when the appointment have been changed, it is the exception, it is not the general rule. Only one person can change this appointment. All the other appointments were kept in accordance with his time and has never been changed once that appointment has been set. When I look at Job, Job chapter 14 and verse 5, this is what Job says. Since his days are numbered, referring to man, or since his days are determined, let me use the past tense. Since his days were determined, the number of his months is with you in your control, and you have made his limits so he cannot pass his allotted time. So we know without a shadow of a doubt, by looking at this verse, that all of us have an appointment, and that appointment is with death. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, it is appointed. Appointed there means there is a set time to all of our lives. Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you live in Crosby's or you live in Grace Farm, whether you live in Hodges Bay or you live in Point, all of us have an appointment time attached to all of our lives. And again, for emphasis, 
Let's look at how Job look at it. Listen to what he says. Referring to man, since his days were determined, the number of his months is with you. With you who? With God. All of us. The time that God has allotted to us is with him. The beauty about it is that we don't know, but he knows. And listen to what he says. And you have made his limit so he cannot pass his allotted time. God has allotted a time to each and every one of our lives. And Job is saying that, listen, that allotted time, the end time, is called the appointment. Also, the second thing that I'm going to be speaking on is still on the appointment. And it is said there that it is appointed, which means that death is unavoidable. There is absolutely nothing that we can do to stop death when the time comes. It says that it is appointed unto man. So we see the appointment, we see death is inevitable, and so this is point number two. When Hebrew says that it is appointed, I want you to know this. Two things that our parents cannot do for us. They cannot appoint our birth and they cannot appoint our death. This appointment that Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 is referring to, it is not set by a doctor so he can change the appointment. It is not set by us either, so that when the time comes, we can make excuses and say, well, you know what? I did not do this, and so I'm not ready yet. Or I need to do a little bit more before I can go into the next stuff, or before I fulfill that appointment. That appointment is totally out of our hands. This appointment, that Hebrews 9.27 is referring to was set by God and no doctor, no operation, no praise can cancel that appointment when the time comes. Let me say this to you. Many prayers were made for the disciples when they were in trouble. And many of the disciples died as martyrs. When our time comes, there is absolutely nothing. The doctors can do their very best. We can do the very best we can. There's nothing, not even prayers when the appointed time comes, can change God's appointed time for man. Some of you would want to question this, but you cannot question it or you will be questioning the Bible. There are only two persons who ever escaped this appointed time. And I'm going to tell you about them further down in the study. But what we need to understand is that it is so important for us to note that when that time is set, we can't change it. And some of us believe that we have the leash on life and so we can do what we like. But according to Hebrews and according to Job, they are actually telling me that there is an appointed time set and none of us, don't care who we are, whether we're rich or poor, can overstay our time. Now usually, a subject like Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 is what you would hear at funeral. Yet, it is an express fact of everyday life. All of us, sooner or later, must keep a personal, unavoidable appointment with death. Yes, I, I, I've just said that. All of us, at some time, must keep a personal, unavoidable appointment with debt. And I don't know 
what you're thinking. And some of you might be asking the question, why is it that you want to speak on the subject of debt? But what we need to understand is that once there is life, the next thing that we need to look forward to is death. And so we have to speak on the subject and give a total balance of the life that each and every person has to live on earth. Christ spoke about death and he spoke about life. And if Christ spoke about death, then those of us who are his servant also need to speak to the issue of death. Because what we're doing when we speak about death, those people who are alive, who believe that they can do what they want, say what they want, behave how they want, and then when they die, that's it. We have to warn you that that is not the case. And so, as we look here, we look at two aspects of appointment. One is that God has set the time, and two, this appointment is unavoidable. We can't stop it, not even with prayers. And I'm going to say it again. When that time comes, not even with prayers can we stop it. It is God's appointed time. And because he knows best, he set the allotted time, and none of us can pass that time. The third fact that I want to make in this one particular scripture verse is this. It says, it is appointed unto man. What does that mean? Is this referring to a man? No. You are no exception. When it says it's appointed unto man, it is not gender specific. It is referring to male and female. It is referring to male and female. Once we were born, we are going to die. None of us know how we're going to die. None of us know when we're going to die. But the Bible make it clear that one day, all of us will face death sometime except the Lord return. Ecclesiastic chapter 3 and verse 2 makes a very pertinent point. And what it did, it actually spoke to the issue of what life is about. The plants, the animals, humans. And listen to what it says in Ecclesiastic chapter 3 and verse 2. It says, there is a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot what was planted. So we see for a fact that throughout the scriptures, we are seeing that the issue of death has been addressed and that all of them speaks to the issue of a birth and a death, or a beginning and an ending. Most people live their lives as if they are exceptions to this rule. Unless Jesus' second coming occurs in our lifetime, we personally will not be exempted from death. Which simply means that if the rapture does not take place today, those of us who are living today will sometime down the road face death. In all humanity, the Bible tells us of only two persons who have never faced death. Only two. And I'm going to tell you who they are. One is Enoch in Genesis chapter 5 verses 23 to 24. And the other was Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 2 verses 1 and 11. If you want to see those two men and what happened in their lives, you can look at these two verses that I've just spoken to you about. I want to show you also, because a lot of people believe that is when they are born that there's a determination as to when they die. But that is not scriptural either. We just saw Job 
And now we're going to look at Psalm, Psalm 139, verse 16. And this should settle the subject, the topic, the discussion about people dying before their time. It is God who sets the time. And God knows exactly what he's doing. And this is what he said in Psalm 136 and verse 16. And if this is true, and not if it is true, because God's word is true, then this tells me something about life and death. Listen to what he says. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were appointed to me, when as yet there was not one of them even taken shape. You know what the psalmist is saying here? Before I was born, my days, date of birth, was written in God's book. And my end date, my date of exit, was written in God's book even before I saw one day of my own personal life, which tells me that since Job said that the allotted time, none of us can go beyond. And this is telling me that my very days were numbered before I was born. This tells me that is not when I was born, my day was determined, but my day was determined before and my exit date was also determined before I was born. Now let's go to point number four, because also we need to understand that it is said that it is appointed unto man. And so I have cleared the issue as to what it has to do with gender. It has nothing to do with gender. And now it is going on to say, once to die. Notice, we don't have a lot of time to die and then reborn and then born and then reborn. It says, it is appointed unto man once to die. You only die once, not twice. Now let me make this clear. In the New Testament, and even in the Old Testament, we have some persons, again going back to the exception and not the rule, we have a number of persons who have died and were resurrected. That's the exception, it's not the rule. The others, and notice, even though they died and were resurrected, they died again. So you still see that there is an appointed time. No one will escape God's appointed time. And so we see you have only once to die. You die only once. Hebrews tells us we have only one opportunity to die. It brings home the fact that we don't get a second chance at life. It's a one-timer. It's a one-time offer. There's no second chance. Now you may ask the question, why do you say that, sir? Because scripture gave it to me. And my support for what I'm saying comes from scripture. Jesus himself taught this. And so I have to follow what Jesus taught. Now let me make this clear, because I don't want to be scaring anybody. What I want to do is to bring the reality of life to you so that you will recognize that your life is not for you to live it how you please and to determine when you please what you do, how you like, when you like, because all of us, our lives, have a starting point and an ending point. Now, it's appointed unto man once to die. Now let me make this clear. Christ died, man died. But I'm gonna show you the difference between the two deaths. Man's appointment is mandatory. Christ's appointment 
was voluntary. Did you get that? Man's appointment is mandatory, which means it has to happen. Christ's appointment was voluntary, which means that Christ gave up his life. He gave it up and then pick it back up again. The only person who have ever done that was Christ. For man, it's mandatory. For Christ, it was voluntary. So please remember that. Now, this takes us all the way back to Genesis. The appointment for man's death takes us all the way back to Genesis. And let's look at what happened in Genesis. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17. When God placed man in the garden, and a lot of people don't understand this. I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again this morning. There was only one law in the garden. God said to man, of every tree in the garden you shall eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat thereof. There, is on, there was only one law in the garden. And today, I can tell you this. There is still only one law or basically one sin that a man can commit. And I, I know you pastors are going to take me to task for this. But you will see that what I'm going to be saying now is supported by scripture. Let me show you what I'm saying to you. If a man lie, if a man steal, if a man commits adultery, if a man gossip, if a man slander, if a man murder, there is only one thing that that man did, only one law that he, 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 he infringed upon. You know what it is? Disobedience. There is only one law that man can break for God, and that's disobedience. Any sin that you and I commit, it's a disobedience to what God has commit, commanded. One law in the garden, and that one law is the very same law that all of us are, are, are doing today. Disobedient. And so when God told Adam in the garden, listen, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He says, from the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. That is where death began. Adam did not die right away. But from the time he ate the fruit, the progress to physical death began. And so we see that that wants to die started all the way back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17. And it is still very prevalent today. I want to make a very important point here. Since there's one opportunity to die. Since there's one opportunity to die, do we do what we like during life? Because you know what some people do? Some people say, well, I have one life to live, so let me eat, drink, and be merry, have fun, get drunk, and do what I like. Let me make this clear this morning. That is the worst mistake that you can ever make. The life that each one of us have is not our life. It was given to us, and we were made stewards of it. I want to make that clear this morning. The life that you and I are living on this earth today, it was given to us by God. We were made stewards of it. Now I want to show you, because some of you like to question the Bible, and you want to question what I'm saying. And I'm going to show you two things this morning, two words, stewards or owner. Let's look at the difference, and you can tell me if you're the owner of your life or you're a steward. Let's look at the steward. Point number one, a steward must use the property as the owner wish. 
The owner is sovereign and he uses his property as he sees fit. You notice the difference? The steward must use the property as the owner wish. The owner is sovereign and uses property as he wish. That's point one. Number two, the steward must give an account as to how he used the property of the owner. The owner does not give an account to anyone of how he uses property. It belongs to him. You tell me, if you're going to have to give an account for your life, are you the owner or a steward? Looking at these two examples, you can see right away that we are not the owners of our lives, but we are stewards of them. And so if we think that because we have one life to live, that we feel that we don't have to give an account for God, it is the worst mistake that you can ever make. Because every one of us someday will stand before God to give an account. And since we have one life to live, it is very important that we make sure that that one life we have to live, that we utilize it properly while we're here on earth, because after this, there is no more opportunity available to us. Surely we should not waste our lives, but live as if we know that the only one we have, someday we're going to give an account for it. We need to live for the glory of God. And this is what 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12 says. Like such good lives, and let me correct that. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they cause you or accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visit. For a debt... And this is what I'm putting in here for those of you who think that you have one night to live so you can do what you like. For a debt, every man's final state is determined. You know what that is actually saying to you? A debt, you have already determined where you're going to spend your final destination. Once you are dead, there is no hope. There is no change that can be made to your final destination. You notice, it is the way you live while you're here on earth that determines your final destination, which is going to bring us to a very important point, point number uh, five, I think, we're going to come to in the next few minutes. Now, some people say, well, you know what? No, I don't believe in you die once i believe in reincarnation which means that i die today and i come back as a calf i die tomorrow and i come as an elephant i die the other day and i come back as somebody else let me tell you something that is such an erroneous teaching that is way contrary to the bible the bible never taught that and i'm going to tell you what some people do what they do, they use the statement, you must be born again, to say that, listen, that is the reason why you can come back as some animal or somebody else. Let me tell you something. This is not speaking of a physical birth. This is speaking of a physical birth, spiritual birth, sorry, in John chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. So we need to understand this. This reincarnation business has nothing to do with scripture and nobody's coming back as nothing. When you die, you go and you await something to happen, which is what we're going to be coming to in the next few minutes. So don't let nobody tell you that you can live how you like and then when you die, you can come back as this person doing something else. It's not going to happen. Jesus never thought that. The scripture never teaches that. And when they use, you must be born again, please let them know that the born again that Jesus was referring to in John chapter 3 was actually a spiritual birth, born of the Spirit. Now, listen to what he says. And after this, 
point number five. And after this, now when I heard that, and I looked at that, it puzzled me because at first, I used to hear people tell me, when my dead, my done. So right now, me gonna live it up, do what I feel like, serve my like, and guess what? Nobody can do anything about it. When I looked at this, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. I said, so there's something after that. Is there something after that? The answer is yes. Don't let Satan fool you. Death is not the end. It is not the end. It is the end of life on this earth. But it is not the end. If it was the end, then the Bible would not make any sense in saying, after this, the judgment. But the Bible knows best. And that's why the Bible says that it is appointed unto man once to die. And then it continue after this. Pay attention to that. This actually puts life and death in view. This tells us something that is very pertinent. That the life that you and I were made steward of, we better live it the way the owner wanted us to live it. We better live it the way God wanted us to do. Or God intended for us to live. Because there is coming a day when we are going to die. And what we do on this earth is the determining factor what happened after death. It is because of love why I speak to you this way. It is because of love. It is because of concern. It is because I do not want any person to die and go to hell. Why I speak on this subject this morning. As I said before, this is not a schematic. This is to bring to our remembrance that death is certain and that none of us are exempt from it. We also need to know that is so permanent, but in one sense, that is not permanent at all. There is something after death, and I will show you how the Bible described death in John chapter 11 and verse 11. You see, when the Bible speaks to Christian and death, it refers to that death as a sleep. And this is what it says. He said this, our friend Lazarus, this is Jesus, when Lazarus died, Jesus said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. If when you're dead, you're done, then why was Jesus going to wake him up? Because Lazarus went into a state of sleep. And that's why Jesus said he's going there to wake him up. Now, let me make this clear. Because some of you are saying, oh, so then Lazarus was not dead. Yes, Lazarus was dead. Jesus plainly said afterwards, yes, Lazarus was dead. But for the believer, what that is, it's a temporary state. And that's why he says, Lazarus, our friend, has fallen asleep. And I am going to go and wake him up. In 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13, what we also need to understand there is that it was mentioned there. And you can read that for yourself. 1 Corinthians 4 13 to 18. Those who seek to follow Jesus... There lies beyond death an inheritance imperishable, reserved in heaven. Those of us who don't think that we should do what we, we like with our own lives, but live the way God ordained it to be, we need to know there lies beyond death an inheritance imperishable, which means will never perish. And that 
imperishable life, that imperishable inheritance is reserved for us in heaven. 1 Peter 1 verses 3 to 9. Now let's look at the, other, the last part of it. And this is very important. It says, and after this, the six facts, after this, the judgment. Death is our destiny doers, one for the believer and one for the sinner. This is important for us to note, and I'm going to repeat it again. Death is our destiny doers, one for the believer and one for the sinner. What does that mean, Pastor? The Bible said it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Death is your destiny doors. Death is your destiny door. What do you mean? Death on this earth closed one door for you back here, but leads you into another door on the other side of death. We read this, and I'm going to show you how the Christian door is open for the Christian and how the sinner's door is open for the sinner. We don't go through the same judgment door. We go through two different doors, and I'll explain it. We read in details of the event in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. This is the door that when the time comes, when the Christians are going to be judged, this is what is going to happen. I want to make this clear. The Christians and the unsaved will not be judged at the same judgment seat. There will be two different seats, two different judgment. And let me explain them to you this morning. And you're going to see what is going to happen with that for the Christian. And you're going to see what happened to those for the unbelievers. I want you to pay attention and tell me if you would not want to be in the one that I mentioned first. It is totally your choice. But when we look at the choices that are available after death, tell me if you would not want to be in the first one. Listen to what 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 13 says. Every man's work, which means every Christian's work, shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. What we do is going to be tested by the fire of God's word. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he had built thereupon when he was alive on earth, he shall receive a reward. God shall reward him for the good things that he did while he was on earth and alive. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now explain that to me, Pastor Jeffers. What is the Bible saying? What is Jesus saying? What is the word of God saying in this? It is saying that even though a man is saved, the level of reward is not going to be the same. Some people, those persons who went on missions and, and, and were, went and see a lot of people came to Christ, they will be graded higher. They will be rewarded for all the good things that they have done. Some people got saved, but all they did was got saved and never moved on to anything else. Those persons, they give, but they give grudgingly. They give or they do stuff and you have to beg them to do it. What the Bible is saying is that what every man do, every Christian did while he was on earth, it will be tested by fire. And if the fire burn it up, it means that it was not good works. But guess what? Not because the works were burned up by fire. 
the life of the person will be saved because the person truly gave his or her life to Christ. But the work or the, the things that they did to receive reward, those will be burnt up. And so he will not receive a reward, but his soul will be saved, yet so as by fire. Now, I want you to pay attention to the next thing that I'm going to say to you. Notice, the believers are not judged. I want, you, I want to make that clear. The believers are not judged. So then, pastor, what is judged? What is it that is judged? Our works are judged. Our works are judged. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So we are not judged. What is judged are our works. Our works are what are going to be judged, are going to be tested by fire. And when those works are tested by fire, those of us who were not living right will be saved, but there will be no reward. And those persons who would have toiled and served God eloquently, efficiently, while they were on this earth, they will be rewarded. So the believer will not be judged but his works will be judged. For the unbeliever, his judgment will occur at the great white throne judgment, where he will be judged according to his works. Now notice, the unsaved will be judged based on his works. The believers will not be judged, but his works will be judged. Let's look and see if this is a fact. Revelation chapter 20 Verses 11 to 12 says this, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was not found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and one book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of these things which were written in the books according to their works. Notice this, according to their works. These judgments do not happen at the moment of death. But they will both happen at some point before the eternal day began. The question is, are you ready for that judgment day? Are you going to be in that first judgment? where your works will be judged and not you? Or are you going to be in the second? Let me tell you this. Let me complete that reading of Revelation that you need to know. The Bible says that the persons whose name were not found written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. The life that you live here on earth will determine your destiny. Whether you go to heaven to be with Christ or you go to hell to be with the devil and his angel. Let me ask you some questions as I close this morning. Have you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ so you will have, not have to be judged by his hands when that day come? I urge you, before you meet your appointed date, which can happen at any time, any second now, it can happen today, it can happen tomorrow, it can happen the next minute, it can happen the next hour. I want to ask you this morning, are you prepared for death? Are you prepared that at this moment, if you die, that you know that you're going to be with your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? You can be. You see, we make preparation for funeral, we make preparation for wedding, we make preparation for church, we make preparation for work, we make preparation for everything. Can I ask you a question? Have you made preparation for that? Remember, all of us at some time will die. But it's what we do for Christ on this side will last. I have gone to many funerals, conducted many funerals, and every time I go to a funeral and that casket is open, I always look in there. You know why? It's a rhetorical remark. 
It's a no-brainer. But every time I look, I said, boy, you can work for everything in this life, but when death come, only you alone sit in that casket. Nothing else. You can't take the money with you. You can't take your house with you, your cars with you, nothing. And so let me say this to you. The only thing you can take from this side of life to that side is your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what counts. And so this morning I want to say this to you as I close. If you are not prepared for death, you can be. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, For if you shall believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. That's all you need to do. Just be sincere in your heart. Ask Jesus to come into your heart this morning. Just tell him, listen, you know what? I've been living my life how I please. I felt that I had one life to live and I'm going to live it up. And I'm going to do what I feel like until that time come when I die. But guess what? Now listening to that pastor, I recognize that that's not true. That there is coming a time when I'm going to have to stand before you, God. And I want to ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and make me that person you want me to be. So that I can spend eternity with you. And if you have said that prayer this morning, that's all you need to do to have Jesus come into your life and to change you from who you are to who he wants you to be and to change your destiny from hell to heaven. May God bless you this morning. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for listening to Focusing on God's Word with Pastor Everton Jeffers, a Bible-based study revealing the Word of God. You can follow Pastor Jeffers on God's First Radio at 102.9 FM from 1 p.m. each Sunday or on Abundant Life Radio at 103.9 FM. You can also follow him on Facebook or the YouTube channel. Thank you once again for listening to Focusing on God's Word. May God continue to bless you.